What's up, everyone? I'm Thomas J. Beleza, and welcome to The Right Mindset. Uh, have you found the right outline that has worked best for you, or are you still searching? Well, today, we're going to answer that question with the ultimate guide to outlining your story. We're going to basically explore the 27 chapter outline. Now, today's video is a cleaned up version that expands on the original 27 chapter outline video that I did when I first started the channel way back almost two years ago. Oh my God. And I will be streamlining what I had done in that video and adding additional information, uh, which ultimately is uh, how to use it. And I'm going to show you examples. So let's see what happens. So why is it important? Well, if you're a plotter like me, uh, also, I like discovering within the plotting element, but that's another story. And the thing is, if you are a plotter, it uh, it's good to understand how to get the most out of the 27 chapter outline and effectively structure a narrative. Now, if you're a pantser, this video might help you prepare mentally for the major beats of the narrative and not necessarily all the micro beats and, and saying, all right, let me just map out every little idea, but saying, I have this big one and this big one and that big one coming. So I should really think about that, but I don't necessarily have to pre map it. So with that said, this method not only provides a clear roadmap for your narrative, ensuring that the narrative itself has a compelling beginning, middle and end, but it also allows for flexibility and creativity within that structure. By adapting this outline to your own writing style, you will see that uh, you can enhance the depth of the richness in your story because you're not confined by the rules set by the original structure. So whether you're a seasoned writer or just starting out, take this technique as a way to improve your writing process and becoming more efficient in focusing your narrative. Now, I will say this, it's about finding a balance between structure and creativity that works best for you. Ensuring your stories are both well organizing, organized and engaged. What are the objection, uh, ob objectives for the lesson? Well, we hope to gain an understanding of the 27 outline and its structure and why it's a powerful tool. We're going to learn to adapt the 27 chapter outline to fit your unique writing style and genre requirements, especially for complex narratives like epic fantasy, however, or, or thrillers. But you might be a romance novelist. You might be an urban fantasy novelist. You might be um, maybe a young, young, young adult, whatever. You can utilize this, this outline uh, technique and template for those uh, with some adaptation. Now we're going to learn and break down each plot point within the 27 chapter outline. I'm going to provide you with knowledge uh, to craft detailed, engaging narratives within those plot points. Um, and I will go over, uh, I'll break it down. I'll start with the simplified version, just listing it out so you can write it down and get it, get it out on paper. And then I'm going to go a, a little deeper into the plot points and then I'm going to show you examples. And then I'm going to do a quick, uh, three plot point, uh, example in real time to show you how it helps with fluidity of narrative brainstorming. And we will explore alternative structures and introduce, uh, so some people in the earlier video that I did, they were like, can you can you utilize this structure? It's a three act template. Can you use it with other variations of that? And yes, you can. I'm going to show you how to turn it into a four act, a six act and a nine act structure. <clears throat> All right. So what is the 27 chapter outline? The original version of the 27 chapter outline, as I had found years ago, is straightforward. It is an outline with 27 chapters with each chapter representing a major plot point within the narrative. Okay. So if you were going to look at it as is, it's three acts, nine sections uh, all together and 27 plot points. What does that look like? Well, there are three acts and each act has three sections. Okay. And each section has three plot points. Okay, and that's why you get 27 plot points. If you did 3,000 words per chapter, that comes out to about, or literally, 81,000 words for your book. And that's a pretty hefty 
straightforward novel that, you know, you're not doing anything too crazy. It's not an epic novel. It's not a, a novella. And like I said, I personally discovered it from Kate O'Keefe, <clears throat> though I have gotten comments about uh, how she didn't specifically create it. So my uh, amendment to that is I originally found it from her. I learned it from her. And then I assimilated into what worked best for me. Which brings me to my version. My version. So my version became the 27 plot point outline. And since I wrote, since I uh, write mostly epic fantasy novels, I reworked the 27 chapter outline to accommodate my personal writing process. All the plot points remain the same, uh, except now I don't limit myself to one plot point to one chapter. I might explore plot points over the course of maybe three chapters or two chapters or five chapters. If I did three chapters, if I was like, you know what? The inciting incident is going to be three chapters long. So I'll allow the first chapter to sort of introduce that theme, the elemental uh, narrative truth of the inciting incident. The second chapter will really dive deep into it. It'll be the heart of it. And the third chapter would be sort of the resolution of that larger inciting incident. Uh, in epic fantasy, you could do this with uh, battles too, like a, a big battle. The battle can have like the setup to the battle, the first half of the battle, the second half of the battle, and then like the resolve of the battle. And that could all still be one plot point. <clears throat> so let's uh, let's do a breakdown of each plot point, shall we? Shall we? Shall we? The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you uh, the acts with their sections. Okay, so get a piece of paper, write that down. Remember, each section has three plot points. Okay. Um, so act one has these three. It has section one, set up the ordinary world. It has section two, a problem disrupts the protagonist's life. And section three, the protagonist's life changes direction. Now, again, I will go into these in greater detail. Let me just state them for those who are brand new to the to the outline. And uh, for those who know, it's, it's a nice refresher. Act two, also known as the conflict, has these three plot, these three sections. Section four, the protagonist explores the new world. Section five, crisis of the new world, the midpoint conflict. And section six, finding a solution. And act three has three sections as well. And those are section seven, victory seems impossible. Okay. Section eight is the protagonist finds the power. And section nine is the protagonist fights and wins. So let's look at the acts and their three plot points per act. All right. This is going to be exciting. All right. So section one, setting up the ordinary world, has plot point one, which is the ordinary world before the disruption. Number two is the inciting incident. Okay. And plot point three is the protagonist reacts to the inciting incident. If we were to look at this as a romance, basically, this would be, um, you might see like uh, Jane, all right? She's a career-focused architect. Uh, she's living a predictable life, balancing her demanding job and her, uh, her friends in a bustling city. Set that up. So that means <clears throat> in plot point one, you set that up. You can set it up in one chapter, or you could set it up over three chapters. Maybe the first chapter is her uh, her architectural life. The second chapter could be her night out with her friends, right? Very simple. The plot point two, the inciting incident, might see uh, Jane is at her best friend's wedding, 
right? And Jane has a disastrous encounter with Tom. <laughs> That's me. Uh, a charming, of course, but seemingly carefree photographer. Okay. So now she has to react to the inciting incident, which is despite their rocky start, circumstances keep bringing Jane and Tom together, sparking an undeniable, if reluctant, attraction. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's go to section two. A problem disrupts the protagonist's life. All right. Which is plot point four. The protagonist reacts to the to and reflects on the long term impacts of the inciting incident. Plot point five is the protagonist decides to take action. And plot point six is the immediate consequence of the protagonist's action. If we were going to continue the romantic story, Jane finds out that Tom has been hired to photograph her latest project, forcing them to work together. Hmm? Number five, the protagonist decides to take action. Jane tries to maintain professionalism, but their bickering masks a growing chemistry. Okay. Number six, the consequence or the immediate consequence. Right? After a series of comedic missteps during a work event, Jane and Tom share an unexpected tender moment, hinting at deeper feelings. Okay. All right. Let's keep it going. Section three, the protagonist's life changes direction. This is the last section of act one. And that is plot point seven. The protagonist's life changes as a result of the action they took, which creates pressure and stress. Plot point eight is the first plot twist or pinch happens. And plot point nine is because of the twist, the protagonist is pushed into the new world. How do we look at that? <clears throat> with the story, we, the, the example I'm giving. Number seven. Well, encouraged by her friends, Jane starts to let her guard down, enjoying Tom's company and the excitement he brings into her life. Which then takes us to plot point eight, which is the first plot twist or pinch happens. Another At another social event, they end up pretending to be a couple for a laugh. And surprisingly, they find themselves enjoying uh the uh the act of pretending a little much a little too much okay that's the pinch that would be more of a pinch than a plot twist because of the twist or plot or 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 pinch the protagonist is pushed into the new world so the fake relationship ruse actually leads to a genuine uh moment of connection causing jane to question her strict life plans okay Act two. Now, this is the conflict. OK, we set everything up. We learn their positions. We understand Jane in this situation and what she really wants and what she's been working for. All right. We set up that there is a potential spark between them and that they do actually get along. OK. So section four, the protagonist has to explore this, right? They have to explore the new world. And that's why plot point 10 introduced the protagonist and audience to the new world, which is the feeling she's having and the experience. Plot point 11, the protagonist can take a break and have a little fun, right? Um, <clears throat> by the way, that that's really where like characters kind of like take a break and the audience is learning about characters as they learn about themselves or the characters around them. Plot point 12 is the protagonist compares their current world to how things were at the beginning. So in this example, plot point 10 would probably be Jane and Tom start spending more time together under the guise of their fake relationship, experiencing real dates and uh, intimate moments. OK, so they're playing with that, uh, that fake that like uh, fake relationship kind of thing. They're just kind of like leaning into it, though, because they're enjoying having fun doing the, the the guys right which means plot point 11 is uh they take the protagonist can take a break and have a little fun they navigate a series of comedic and romantic situations that bring them closer including a disastrous cooking date <laughs> and a dance lesson filled with laughs and mishaps now the old juxtaposition of the situation would be jane sees a side of tom that contradicts her first impression, discovering his compassionate and responsible nature, which challenges her initial judgments. 
Now, this is a very on the nose example with the juxtaposition where, you know, she had a thought about who he was in the very beginning, but his behavior is showing her a different side and she's like comparing the two. It doesn't always have to be a very specific thought of all juxtaposition. The story itself, like if she's not necessarily noticing that per se, but their behavior is different than the original. Okay. And that behavior is letting her think that maybe this could go somewhere. That would also be an old juxtaposition. Like they don't actually have to have the, they don't have to say the words like, Oh, he's different. All right. Here comes the conflict. Plot point 13, build up the midpoint conflict and midpoint itself. Plot point 14 is the midpoint conflict of the narrative. And plot point 15 is the immediate reaction or consequence of the midpoint conflict. Okay, so plot point 13. Boop. Okay. Their relationship deepens, but Jane struggles with the blurred lines between their pretend romance and her growing feelings. Ooh. Which takes us to the midpoint conflict. At a pivotal moment, perhaps during a romantic but comedically flawed trip, they share a passionate kiss, making their feelings unmistakably real. Okay. Before I go any further, just understand, the midpoint conflict reveals the truth of the lie. The literal lie here is that they're just f going on fake dates and it's a guy, it's, it's a guy. So they're just having fun with it. They enjoy kind of like they like each other's company, but they enjoy going on fake dates. But that kiss reveals the truth of the lie, which is there's something real about this. OK, now, more importantly, as you can see with my example, not all midpoint conflicts have to be negative. They just need to reveal the truth of the lie and escalate uh, the situation. More importantly, the tension of the situation is being escalated, which leads to plot point 15, the immediate reaction or consequence. OK. Uh, the moment the moment is interrupted by a misunderstanding or revelation, such as Jane discovering Tom's potential job offer in another city, causing her to pull back, fearing she's just another project for him. Now, that doesn't mean that it happens directly after the kiss and they're like, Oh, this might be real. This would be like another scene. This might happen a day or two later or what have you. And it's just a moment where they really, you have to introduce the job opportunity. Okay. Plot point 16. So section six, finding a solution plot point 16, the protagonist reflects on the long-term impacts of the midpoint conflict. Okay. Plot point 17 is the protagonist decides to take some action okay, uh, to resolve the problem created by the midpoint conflict. And uh, plot point 18, despite the setbacks, the protagonist decides that they will succeed no matter what. So what would this be? So if we look at the uh, plot point 16, that would be the misunderstanding leads to a cooling off period where they both reflect on their feelings and what went wrong. Plot point 17, the protagonist decides to take action to resolve the problem created in the midpoint conflict. Jane tries to focus on her career and forget Tom, forget him, forget him, but she finds it difficult. Tom, on the other hand, realizes he must make a grand gesture to win her back. Which leads to plot point 18. Despite her fears, Jane admits to herself and her friends that she's truly fallen for Tom, uh, deciding she needs to communicate her feelings openly, openly, openly. Oh, see, isn't that nice? It's a nice little romance. All right. Now we have to resolve all this, everything that we set up, the conf the, the introduction of who these characters are, and then we kind of put them in and we challenge them. We saw who they were, and now they get to kind of play with each other, and uh, we kind of we elevate that tension. We need to resolve this. We have to get this story over. So section seven, victory seems impossible. Plot point 19 is the protagonist faces significantly difficult trials that is something they never experienced before. 
Plot point 20 is another plot twist or pinch. Uh, the protagonist experiences a completely unexpected event, making all things worse. Whew. And then plot point 21. The plot twist or pinch leads to the darkest moment. The thought of success is incomprehensible. Plot point 19. Okay. So this is where uh, Jane preparing to confess her feelings, right? She learns about a miscommunication regarding Tom's job offer, making her believe she's lost her chance, right? It's always about miscommunication. What's the deal with that? Plot point 20. Tom organizes a grand romantic gesture publicly declaring his love in a way that humorously ties back to their initial disastrous encounter. You know what I'm saying? That's uh that is a pretty dark uh, that is a pretty funny plot twist. All right. 31. Okay. The uh the darkest moment. Just before Tom's gesture, Jane is at her lowest, believing she's missed her opportunity for love and happiness with him okay all right okay so she's she's on a down the protagonist is on a down but the uh the the antagonist technically the love interest is on an up and they're like Woo-hoo, let's do this which brings us to the protagonist finds power within section eight plot point 22 having hit rock bottom the protagonist remembers their desire to succeed and find the power within Plot point 23 is after deciding they can do it, the protagonist takes action. And plot point 24, the converge power within leading to the final battle. Okay. So 22 would be motivated by Tom's declaration of love. Jane finds the courage to face her fears of vulnerability and commitment. Plot point 23, she rushes to confront Tom, leading to a heartfelt and humorous exchange where they both admit their mistakes and feelings. And then, of course, 24, we got to converge all the subplots and everything and lead to the final battle or the final chance for victory. Uh, The public declaration brings all their friends and some amusing side characters together, supporting their union and celebrating their love. So now this brings us into the final moment, which is ultimately section nine, the protagonist fights and wins. So will they, <clears throat> will their step forward lead to the resolution of their relationship? And they, they try this, they, they move forward to it. Well, plot point 25 suggests that the protagonist has one last battle. Okay. At plot point 26 is that <clears throat> they're either going to fail or succeed. Okay, and plot point 27 is ultimately what is the immediate reaction to the decision in the last plot point, which is plot point 26. So let's look at plot one, plot point 25. Their final quote unquote battle is a humorous yet heartfelt confrontation where they must overcome their last fears and insecurities in front of an amused and supportive crowd. What is the succeed or fail? Jane and Tom reconcile, sharing a kiss that cements their relationship, acknowledged by cheers from their friends and bystanders. What is the resolution in 27? The story closes with Jane and Tom, now a couple, playfully playfully navigating their lives together, showcasing how they have both grown and how their love has positively impacted their lives. Very straightforward. <clears throat> I like that. Now, are there alternatives to this? Okay. This structure uh, was basically the three acts, nine sections, 27 plot point. Okay. So if I was to show you, um, okay, this is going to be, yeah, the alternative. Alternative ways. Okay. Alternative. These are alternative ways to approach the outline structure. This is the one we just went over. Three acts, nine sections, 27 plot points, okay? Act one, three sections, three plot points. Act two, three sections, three plot points each. Act three, three sections, three plot points each. So here's a four-act structure. This is four-act structure, okay? Act one would still have the three sections. We could look at them that way. But act one only... Uh, utilizes the first three plot points, uh, the first seven plot points, I should say. 
Act one is only the first seven plot points. Okay. Act two then tackles plot point eight to plot point 14. Okay. And then act three will tackle plot point 15 to plot point 20. Okay. And act four will tackle plot point 21 to plot point 27. Now, as you can see, the plot points have to happen in any story, but how you isolate them within the acts is up to you. There are a couple things that have to be what they are, right? So <clears throat> if you notice act two, plot point 14 is the midpoint conflict that ends before the second half of act two. And that's because act one needs to set up the ordinary world and needs to have the inciting incident. Okay. That's, that has to happen. And then the twist there's a there's a twist in act one that leads to act two and then act two has to have that midpoint conflict right it has to have that battle it also has to set up the new world act three is all about finding the solution and act four is just simply the resolution so let's look at a six act version okay again act one definitely has the inciting incident well it plays with the four first pl plot points <clears throat> act two we're actually breaking up uh so because we're doing six acts the first three acts are kind of playing with the first half of your story and then acts four five and six are playing with the second half of your story so act one act two is um we're really exploring the disruption of their world act three leads to the midpoint conflict Okay. Act four heads away from the midpoint conflict. Act five basically is, is working within the solution of what happened with the conflict. And act six is the resolution. And look, let's look at act, the nine act. Now, the way I did this is I just turned the sections into the acts. So since there are nine sections... You can turn those into your acts. Now, why did I do that? Because I technically do this for my own stories. The first section I make sure feels like a coherent story <clears throat> that has a beginning, middle, and end. And then I do that for section two, and then I do that for section three. However, I also make sure that act one has a coherent story within itself, Act two has a coherent story in itself and act three has a coherent story in itself. So there is a beginning, a middle and end to my act three. So uh, my three acts because act one, the, the beginning of it is section one. Section two is the middle and section three is the end of act one. So I also look at each of those as their own stories. And I do that. I do that for all of them. OK. All right. I'm going to give you a quick uh, quick tip about all this. Traditionally, you would look at acts where the first and third act are shorter than the second act. In fact, the rule is that the second act is usually twice as big as the first act. In a movie that is 120 minutes long, the first act and third act would be about 30 minutes long. Okay, that's an hour in total, by the way. Well, the second act itself is 60 minutes long on its own. Now, these plot points written as chapters might be 3,000 words per chapter. And when it's finished, you'll see that the plot points map out the evolution of a narrative in the same way that the traditional three act rules apply to writing a narrative. I personally look at these plot points as things that should happen and when they should happen in a narrative and less about how long they are. <clears throat> of course, some plot points are shorter than others, and some are longer. I know that if you look at my outline for my current fantasy novel that I'm working on, some plot points have five chapters. Others have one chapter. Others have two chapters. So... Some plot points can breathe a little. Some just sort of like it's a moment that happens and we move on. Before I go on through to the walkthrough, 
If you haven't done so already and you love what you've been watching, please subscribe and hit that bell icon so you don't miss out. Practice outlining. This is the fun part. So, uh, oh, wait, wait. Boop, 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 boop. Before we do the practice outlining, I do want to give you something special, okay? I want you to look at this next... Uh, I'm going to go over some rules and tools that you can use within the acts and within the uh, the sections and the plot points themselves, okay? Let's do this. <clears throat> so something you should keep in mind when you're working on your first act, okay? These are notes of what should happen in Act 1. I have it on the screen so you can you can just kind of pause it and write, write down what you need. But I'm also going to kind of talk through them. All right? Now... You want to flush out their motivations uh, through the length, the length of Act 1, until they are solidified before Act 2 happens. Uh, this is basically before you can challenge who a character is or characters or even the narrative, you have to set it up to where the, the, the reader understands the motivations and who the characters are and what they are capable of. That doesn't mean in Act 1 we have to see uh, uh, their capableness being challenged, but we can see them working on being capable or watching them be capable, right? <clears throat> so you can challenge that in Act 2. The other thing is establish the premise of the main plot, okay? This is where it's like, well, what is the story about? You know, what is your narrative really tackling? You know, um, is it a self is it all about self discovery? Is it, uh, is, you know, do they have to destroy the one ring? Which, if you look at Lord of the Rings, you know, that's what happens. Gandalf runs off and he reads about the ring, comes back, he goes, We got to destroy this. And the only way to do that is, uh, we got to take it to the, uh, the elves, uh, and they'll, they'll figure it out. <clears throat> and then they learn, Oh, wait, no, we got to actually go, we got to go somewhere with this. Okay. Uh, you in your first act, you should be establishing the rules of the world, as it says on the screen, basically set them up. And by the end of act one, you can now challenge those rules in act two. Rules are like, is there magic? How does magic work? Uh, you don't have to go too deep into how magic works, but you do have to explain that it does work. Uh, it could be soft magic, hard magic, but whatever. If there's shifters or fey or magical creatures or is it a real world is it real world <clears throat> like the romance idea i gave you that's real world so you have to what are the rules of that world well we we establish that just by telling a story because we realize oh this is real world i get it i see how it works okay in some comedies some people end up hurting themselves and don't get hurt so we're establishing okay naked gun I get it. It's going to be crazy. It's punny. Uh, it doesn't take itself seriously. That's setting up the rules of the world. Okay. The other thing is, what is the protagonist capable of? <clears throat> this is a, if if they if they're Harry Potter and they're just they have uh, the innate ability to use magic. Maybe show that, right? If they don't and they're learning, show that. They're not capable of using magic to their full extent. So show them learning how to use magic. All right. So present the premise, uh, the promise of the overall narrative. Okay. Um, as you can see, the promise is what the audience will be rewarded if they follow along. For example, if it were a fantasy and someone mentioned dragons, uh, but it takes magic to destroy it. Then the promise is that we'll see dragons and magic. If it is a romance, you set up the premise as their perfect relationship. It will re reward the audience with either the perfect relationship or sub subvert the expectations and show them that the perfect relationship was always there with the best friend and not necessarily what they thought it should be. The promise is important. So anything that you kind of introduce in the first act, you have to... Uh, let that be earned and, and, and be like, Hey, here it is. <laughs> you know, you can't be like, 
you know, imagine the Lord of the Rings is like, oh, we're going to destroy. We have to destroy the ring. And then they, that's the promise. They're going to destroy the ring. But then they don't. You'd be like, what's going on? All right. <clears throat> Let's look at uh, this. So some things you want to establish in the ordinary world of, of plot point one. OK, is establish the main characters, the protagonist, the antagonistic force. Now, keep in mind, you don't have to show the antagonistic force in the ordinary world before the disruption. But it does need to be mentioned or referenced or the essence of the antagonistic force should be established in one way or another. You want to showcase the world they live in before the inciting incident changes their status quo. So with the romance, <clears throat> we're watching her work as an architect and have a, have a life with friends. Okay. And also in that one, we probably would uh, announce that, uh, oh, remember, we got to go to the wedding. And it's like, I don't have a date. I don't need it. And then the, maybe the main character, Jane's like, I don't need a date. I'll go. I'll go stag. I don't care. Right. And obviously she doesn't care. But then when she meets Tom, me, uh, there's some uh, there's a spark. OK, you want to start the process of establishing the setting and rules. This is done in the first plot point. However. You can continue to do these things throughout Act 1, but this is where you start the seeding. This is the first seed of those things. So, again, Act 1, you want to establish a promise. Well, this might be the seed of the promise. So you might show someone with magic, or they might find a magic book, or uh, they might... Well, if they find the magic book, that might be an inciting incident, but, but maybe... Uh, the uncle is casting magic and the protagonist is like, oh, I wish I could do that one day. Well, there's the promise. And we just seeded it. Okay. Uh, if we're talking about Dan Brown, this is in Paris for a symbolic lecture. Harvard professor <clears throat> Wagdon's uh, serene academic life is poised uh, to, conclui to, conclui uh, to collide with extraordinary events far from his usual routine. All right. Spoiler alert, if you haven't read Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code. <laughs> um, oh, sorry. Inciting incidents. Okay, something happens that disrupts the status quo. Their world changes due to something outside their control. In a romance, it would be the meet-cute when they run into a potential love interest. Horror films would be when they end up turning down the wrong road to a cabin. Action stories would be what pushes the protagonist into action, as in with Die Hard, where the bad guys take over the building. <laughs> Example of what would go here if we continue to Dan Brown is a cryptic murderer at the Levy, uh, uh, at the Louvre, at the Louvre, uh, stepped in symbolism. symbolism uh, Langdon knows intimately, yanks him from his academia, uh, ac academic routine into a thrilling mystery. Okay. So he's the only one that can read the symbolism. All right. So what happens in the uh, the reaction to the inciting? Well, you know, notes, uh, what should go here? This is their reaction to what has happened and how they deal with the inciting incident and or there are internal or external changes due to the inciting incident. This is where you spend some time on what happens because they acknowledge the thing that the inciting incident, they're acknowledging it basically. Okay. Or, you know, in an action, uh, let's say, um, let's say, uh, the heroes are at their base and the base gets attacked and the inciting incident is just them being attacked, defending. And then they, at the end of the inciting incident moment, they escape. Plot point three would be them continuing to evade, like retreat. They're, they're not necessarily being attacked anymore. They're in the aftermath of it. And they're like, all right, we got to keep moving. We got to keep moving. Yeah, but they're not coming after us. Well, they might be. So let's keep moving. What just happened? How, you know, how come we didn't know that was coming? Like things like that. <clears throat> with uh, with Dan Brown, and it's uh, reacting to the Louvre murder scene. Uh, Langdon finds himself implicated and drawn into a transformative uh, quest, you know, and Sophie. We all know who Sophie is. She finally appears. Hey, uh, bridging the victim and crucial information, uh, personalities, uh, personalizes the case and reveals a hidden message trying a tying. Oh, man. 
<laughs> my dyslexia is terrible today. Uh, and basically Langdon's uh, expertise to the heart of enigma. Enigma. All right. Please forgive this. Okay. Now, in uh, plot point 14, you want to establish how the inciting incident has changed the world of the protagonist. Okay. All right. Um, so with the Dan Brown thing, uh, this is where the main characters kind of get the final message and it hints at a conspiracy linked to the Holy Grail. <clears throat> And this shatters uh, Langdon's worldview and propels him uh, from his analysis career uh, to chase the truth, basically. And it's like, do I go back to my job <clears throat> or this is it? This is there's something deeper here and this conspiracy needs to be uh, explored. Which takes us to the protagonist decides to take action. And uh, they have to make a decision, okay, that will ultimately impact the rest of the story, okay? And the idea that the Holy Grail and there's this conspiracy and there's like this whole shadowy uh, cabal going on, <clears throat> uh, they're like, we got to do it. Let's decipher the Da Vinci's Code and the clues and, and basically be like, you know what? I need to know. I need to know. So I'm fueled by that. I'm com I have a conviction to that. And there's an immediate consequence to that, okay? The results of the decision, that's all it is. It's just literally what happened and what is the results? How do we, what happens because they did this thing and with the Da Vinci clue unraveling, uh, there's a dance between the police, all right? Uh, and there's a pursuit. <laughs> if you've ever seen the movie, they're driving a little car. Anyway, uh, and you know, there's some danger. Oh my God, what's going on, right? This, this is perilous, perilous. All right. This brings us into their life is disrupted now. Okay. Feel free to pause the video and write anything. I, I'm just I'm just flying through it. Okay. <clears throat> Plot point uh, uh, seven. Their life has changed uh, as a result of the action they took, and it creates pressure and stress. Okay. So the protagonists themselves begin to feel pressure of the task before them. Deciphering clues unveils. Uh, a web of ancient conspiracies and modern day power struggles. Oh, now they end up getting caught in the crossfire between uh, the antagonistic forces over the true nature of the Grail. Ooh. <clears throat> and they face escalating threats and grueling challenges that test their intellect, stamina, and very survival. Very cool. So what is the plot twist that happens? Well, one of the rules that you should keep note of is that things get a little more complicated and the protagonist wonders if the right decision was made. That's a very important thing, right? Okay. They wonder if the right decision was made. Okay. So buried beneath layers of encoded clues, the keystones location uh, in Zurich's impregnable bank throws a wrench in their plans. This unexpected twist elevates the stakes, forcing them to navigate a labyrinth of security uh, and secrecy. Their resolve and resourcefulness hanging in the balance. Okay. The first plot twist or pinch. <clears throat> the plot twist is that it's impenetrable. Um, but they did learn about the Keystone's location, uh, but also the pinches. There's a lot of security. Okay. Numero nine, because of the twist, the protagonist is pushed into the new world. Now, notes of what should go in this is that they are literally pushed into a new direction. So whatever the narrative was doing, the twist has to kind of change the direction. So think of it that way. So if they are heading towards one thing, <clears throat> uh, they got to, they got to kind you got to think of your narrative as being like, Oh, we just got the water just pushed us into another canal. You know, we got to We got to change our, our way. So from the, uh, again, with Dan Brown story, um, so basically, if, you, if you've ever seen the movie or read the books, uh, they fall into the thing right, and there's icy depths and uh, they emerge not just with the keystone, but with a chilling revelation. Mm. The grail secret threatens the very bedrock of faith. Oh, this electrifying truth becomes their point of no return, drawing them deeper into a labyrinth, a, a, 
labyrinth game where past and present clash, demanding their full commitment. Yeah. Okay. So how does that work is in this one, they end up finding uh, the keystone and they have to break into it and then they have to run out. But then they realize that what they found will lead uh, to changing the very fabric of our understanding. Okay. So that leads us to act two. Now, some notes about act two in general that you should keep in mind is that uh, you want to challenge the premise and uh, and the pro and, and create problems. You want to push on the uh, your protagonist's skills and capabilities. You want to create rising tensions. OK, um, which leads us to three very important things is during the ascending rise to the conflict. This shows characters providing that they are capable of what was established in Act one. Still time for new information about the world, characters, goals and narratives. What that means is traditionally, once the midpoint conflict happens after that, you don't want to add new information to help solve the narrative. OK, any information to solve the midpoint conflict in the second half of your story should have been seeded or established somewhere within the uh, first half of your narrative up to the midpoint conflict. You can add new information, but traditionally you want to make sure that any new information to solve problems has at least been seeded somehow, some way, even if slightly, because then it you could fall into the Diaz Ex Machida or um, the Mary Sue's or the Gary Stews. It falls into convenience and con- it becomes contrived. <clears throat> so you want to earn the solutions. Let things sort of like develop within themselves, okay? Uh, within the first half. And in Act 2... The ascending rise to the midpoint conflict, you still have time to start adding and seeding or building on what you have already seeded to allow it to be earned. Another thing is you want to establish characters' weaknesses by challenging their strengths. Put them in situations where they believe they are strong internally, externally, whatever, mentally, spiritually, physically, and put them in situations where they are being challenged. Now, Something I did with my fantasy novel is I established that my character is mucho strong. Okay. Uh, so in the second, the rising, the ascension, the, ascend, <laughs> the ascending rise to the conflict, I actually challenge their mind and their heart, their soul. Because I know they're physically strong. But now I'm saying you just worked your entire life to be strong. And that's the thing that's not helping. Everything else is challenging you. You're being challenged and think because you thought if I'm strong enough, I'll be able to protect people and 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 do what's right by people and survive. And then you realize, oh, wait, I may have misunderstood the threat level. OK. In the midpoint conflict, this is where you push characters to their literal limits, either emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually. Uh, they're basically in over their heads. In the example of the romance thing that I was talking about, uh, you know, um, I'll read it again for you just in case you forgot. Uh, at a pivotal moment, perhaps during a romance. Oh, wait a minute. <clears throat> Here we go. At a pivotal moment, perhaps during a romantic but comedically flawed trip, uh, they share a passionate kiss, making their feelings unmistakably real. Okay. So that's them over their heads. Uh, They weren't expecting that. It was all play of fun and games. And now it's become real. So they are now pushed to their limits. Uh, This is new territory for those characters. Another thing that to keep in mind is that the truth of the lie is revealed in the midpoint conflict. Okay. Descending fall from conflict. What is the solution to their problems? Um, Do not introduce new information directly after the midpoint conflict. You can, uh, but, you know, you, it, it's a very touchy area <laughs> uh, where you can create DSX marketers. However, you could introduce new information that doesn't necessarily affect the narrative, meaning like if it's fantasy, they can meet a new animal, a new species. They could 
uh, go to a new city that hasn't really been explored. As long as that city isn't narratively, if it's narratively important, you want to mention the city at some point earlier in the story. Um, if there's a character that is ultimately the big bad, you wouldn't introduce them in uh, the second half of your novel. There has to be some mention of them. Just some, just some mention. Um, uh, even in Lord of the Rings, you know, by the third book, they're in Mordor and they're dealing like we know everything about those characters by that time. So we don't just meet those characters and their weight by that time. Um, but uh, you want you want to be careful with the information you uh, just create out of nowhere in the second half of the story. So that's why you want to just be cautious. <clears throat> if it is really important in the narrative, think about how I can see this in the first half of the story. OK, but you can introduce elements that don't narratively affect it. Like you could talk about a character or meet a character, a shopkeep that's actually a part of a series or a saga, as long as they're not narratively important. But again, it's your story. You can do whatever you want. These are just rules that can be broken, right? We're almost done. Section four. Okay, plot point 10. This is where we introduce the protagonist and audience to the new world. Some things that could go here is that the protagonist explores the new status quo, their situation, the world, etc. A very straightforward example is if they were on the farm and now they're in a city. Well, let's look at the city, see what the city is about, learn about the city. What are the rules of the city, etc. Which brings us to show the new rules of the new world. Like, what is the change to the status quo? Are there any new obstacles that stand before the protagonist? And also define the characters within the new world. Okay. Um, <clears throat> in this situation, they arrive at... Uh, Tibing's uh, estate brings a uh, breather for Langdon and Sophie, while his grail expertise sheds light on the quest's historical and mythical depths for both characters and readers. Now, notice that character is being introduced in the first. Uh, well, they're sitting down with them and learning about their expertise, and it's in that first plot point of Act Two. And we all know what happens with that person. <clears throat> the protagonist can take a break. So this is where uh, we learn a little about the characters, the relationships, and allow uh, to have some fun. Okay. Usually this is where relationships are built, romance, romantic or otherwise, and characters are developed more. They are allowed to interact with the new world. This happens in every story. Watch a movie, watch a show, read a book. You'll see there's a certain point where the characters aren't really being pushed into extreme tension. Uh, but they're just, they're having fun. And, and um, in this case, uh, you know, a oh, wet wedding, wedding, uh, wedding crashes. Um, uh, it'd be like they're dancing. They're at the party. They're having fun, uh, at the, uh, which we'll call it. Uh, the, <clears throat> When, when they go to the senator's house after the big after the wedding and like Owen Will, uh, Luke Wilson's like, I mean, Owen Wilson's like, oh, uh, uh, let's go. Where they're going to go. And we got to go. Wow. We got to go. And then they go and they go to the house and stuff like that. That that becomes the uh, the funny games um, in this situation. There's a playful puzzle solving uh, that creates a character bomb and explores deeper themes and offers a light reprieve. Well, the mystery unfolds. Okay. All right. Last plot point of section four <clears throat> before we get into the midpoint conflict area. 12 is protagonist compares there. The old oh, juxtaposition. The protagonist compares the other world or eh, old world within the new and is reminded of how much the status quo has changed. Keep in mind that this doesn't mean that they have to have a conversation or internal thoughts about the change. You can show the difference in the world, like in Jurassic Park, before they go to the park and then at the park. So, uh, you know, when they're like, uh, I think we're going to be out of a job. <laughs> That's the just the old just the position. All right. Uh, so just the positioning, uh, Langan's, uh, past knowledge with new discoveries emphasizes transformation journey. 
So basically, he's like, this is what I thought I knew. And it's clearly something else. All right, here we go. This is where it gets really crazy, everyone. <clears throat> the build up. This is the build up to the midpoint conflict. And this is where the protagonist prepares for the major turning point in the story. There are some forms of struggle, internal, and external, that will motivate the protagonist to take matters into their own hands. Sometimes it's just the tension has built in a way that pushes them towards the midpoint conflict. And in this example, uh, you know, in pursuit of the hidden truths, the protagonists confront, uh, you know, they push back against the secrets of Jesus and his lineage, uh, intensifying the suspense and setting the stage for the major narrative turning point leading, leading to. All right. This one's big. <clears throat> okay. The midpoint conflict is a very important moment in any narrative. And the protagonist is going to be challenged to their limits. This will lead them to have to find a solution to overcome their limits. Okay. So because of the challenge pushed to their limits, the whole second half of the second act is going to be about finding a solution to uh, rectify the limitations they've reached. The protagonist encounters something that complicates their plans and motivates them to change the course of events because they've learned the truth of the lie, which is revealed. The midpoint's primary thematic job is that a pivotal uh, of pivoting the protagonist's character arc with a moment of truth. The protagonist will have spent the first half of the story engulfed in an inner battle between the lie they believe and the thematic truth. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, because I got to move it. All right. Whether or not they will learn to move forward and embrace the truth will be decided at the midpoint when they will be confronted with a powerful manifestation of the truth. In a positive change arc, the protagonist will see the truth as true and begin accepting it over the second half of the story, although they will not uh they will not yet fully reject their lie that they believe in a negative change uh, arc they will reject the offered truth and begin plunging even more deeply and uh, irrevocably into the lie in a flat arc they will make a stand for the truth and offer it to supporting characters around them okay let's do a for example in the classic Betty Davis film, now Voyager, uh, the protagonist, uh, Charlotte, returns home to confront her tyrannical mother. This is a wonderful midpoint on so many levels because it's written right there. Fundamentally, it is all about Charlotte's moment of truth. We see or won't see. Oh, oh, oh we will she or won't she revert to the person she used to be <clears throat> and submit to her mother's unreasonable demands. OK. Uh, there is true doubt about which direction she will take, but ultimately she chooses to reject the lie her mother has always told her, that she can't survive on her own. So she does it beautifully and realistically in a real attempt to maintain good relationships with her horrible mother. <clears throat> in Dan Brown's book, the revelation that uh, we know who the villain is teaching, right? we understand. Okay, forcing them to question everything that they knew. This is when their friend ends up being the villain. And they're like, what? But you're my friend. This is what? You were helping us. Okay. 15, the immediate reaction or consequence of that. Well, everything changes and they have to deal with the reality of the truth or double down on their belief of the lie. Now, keep in mind, we are at the point, plot point 15 and beyond. We, we try... You should try not to add new information that hasn't been established that will be the solution. <clears throat> okay. Example of what might go here, if you're looking at Dan Brown, is the revelation about uh, Tb being uh, throws the protagonized uh, quest into disarray, requiring them to pivot, pivot, adapt, and navigate a treacherous new landscape where allegiances are uncertain. Because it changes everything. Who's our friend? Who can we trust? The protagonist reflects on the long-term impacts. Again, they might not have a conversation about it, but they become aware of the world and status quo they are walking toward. <clears throat> you might establish what the protagonist would need 
uh, to do uh, uh, to to not only find the solution, but what are their limitations? So basically what needs to happen in some stories, especially action, they're like, we have to get the X, Y and Z. If we kill the so and so, if we break in the blink and blink, you know, it's it's just they set out the plan. Um, what are the roadblocks, basically? Like what 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 is ahead of them? So in the Dan Brown story, um, OK, they have to regroup, you know, they're like, what do we got to do? And then they're like, oh, well, here's some more clues and historical knowledge to navigate the treacherous path ahead. So they have to collect new information <clears throat> and they know what they have to do. And they're like, we got this. 17, uh, the protagonist decides to take action to resolve the problem created by the midpoint conflict. The protagonist takes matters into their own hands and solves or works around the roadblocks that occurred. Uh, steeled by newfound resolve, the protagonist and I tackle a gauntlet of trials, each unlocking deeper truths and propelling them toward uh, the chapel and uh, you know this is the crucible where their physically and intellectually quests converge. Everything's coming together. Boom, boom, ba, boom, boom, boom. Okay. And eighteen is uh, despite the setback. They will succeed no matter what. How do they find uh, the determination to overcome the overall issues in Roblox? So this is where you kind of work in the story where you're like, what is it inside? What will they do to overcome the situation? And uh, defying formidable, uh, formidable odds, uh, the protagonist arise as unwavering champions of truth. Their resolute pursuit of the grail transcends personal risk and reshaping the very name. This is like basically where they're like, um, we need to find this, you know, because if they get it, it's bad for everybody. But we, we, if we find it, you know, it won't, it won't lead to a uh, irre irrevocable uh, uh, <clears throat> damages. <clears throat> okay. So what should go in Act Three? Well, you want to challenge characters to the breaking point. So. In Act 2, it's their limits, right? And this is their breaking point. We want to discover the strengths within a character, and we want the final battle to begin. We want to elevate the idea that there is a potential for failure, and we want to break down the walls of failure to that victory, and ultimately, there is a reward for victory if victory is even achieved. And then we like to see their new world and who they are now. The resolution. I need some drink. Okay. All right. Plot point 19. Okay. Plot point 19. Uh, the protagonist finds a solution, but now must overcome doubt or some other complication. <clears throat> what, are, what are those solutions? And what are the doubts or complications? Okay. Basically, when they're there, they find themselves at the heart of the grail mystery, and they're like, you know... This is the ancient site, and this is like, if we don't, this is it. We got to go in. Here's everybody. What's going to happen, right? Oh, this is the, the next part is interesting. Uh, so the uh, pinch happens, right? And this is something that happens outside the protagonist's control, meaning no matter what, they can't do anything about it. It's inevitable. And this is when they learn that Sophie is a descendant of Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene making her the living embodiment of the Holy Grail's bloodline. So what is the darkest thought, uh, right? Uh, darkest moment. Well, something happens outside the protagonist's control and brings them to their darkest moment. This could be internal, external, metaphorically, uh, spiritually, etc. The revolution of Sophie's true heritage brings a profound sense of duty and danger as they realize the implications of the secret being revealed to the world. What would that do? what would we do what could we do well having hit rock bottom in plot point 22 you really want to make sure that uh, you establish how they find their courage and strength within to carry on and this should be seeded in the story earlier on that they have that potential in them and uh <clears throat> that this choice isn't out of thin air you know so armed with the truth about her lineage Sophie finds a new sense of identity and purpose while Langdon uh, gains a deeper understanding of faith and history. 
changing who he is, basically. Because remember, things were symbolic, and now there's a chance symbolism is factual to him. Number 23, after deciding they can do it, the protagonist takes action. Well, the protagonist has to take action. They have to overcome the plot twist. And before taking an overall issue again, uh, how do they overcome this plot twist? Like, how do they do it, right? Well, in Dan Brown's book, together they resolve uh, to protect Sophie's secret and decide how to deal with the Grail's legacy in a way that honors uh, the truth and the wishes of uh, Sona. I have trouble saying that name. All right. Uh, here we go. 24. <clears throat> the convergence. Okay. This leads to the final battle. All right. Everything has to come together. Not that all subplots need to be uh, finalized here, but the majority of them are the stronger, thicker ones. Little ones can be resolved a little bit later. All right. Um, but this is also saying that the big event is imminent okay this is usually but not always where the subplots conclude or at least resolve the storylines converge as langdon and sophie now are aware of the full scope of the conspiracy they make peace with their roles in the grail saga and the last three plot points so ultimately the protagonist needs to take uh take action Okay, so how do they do that? How do they take uh, take action, right? In Dan Brown, the final battle is more intellectual and emotional than physical as Langdon and Sophie confront the moral and ethical dilemmas presented by the Grail's secrets. <clears throat> so how do they fail to succeed in 26? For Dan Brown, it's... Uh, this is the... Uh, if you haven't seen the movie, the answer is Apple. <laughs> so they discover the, the meaning and everything. And they're like, oh, okay. And then finally, the resolution is that uh, the immediate reaction to the decision ties up all the loose ends, makes sure the protagonist has changed in some way, a little bit, a lot of it. The novel concludes with Langley and Sophie having protected the secret of the Grail, ensuring its safety and... Uh, preservation of its legacy so uh well also committing uh coming to terms to their personal transformations <clears throat> things to keep in mind is you could literally give each plot point its own chapter and you'll get eighty-one thousand words if there are three thousand words on average you can move things around you could make more chapters per plot point you could break up your outline into you know different uh act lengths it's all up to you it comes down to how you want to tell the story now more importantly i just want you to know uh this template is available if you want this template the link is in the comment section and also the uh the details of the actual video <clears throat> okay let's get to it question which outlining process do you use let me know in the comments below. If it's the 27 chapter outline, I'd love to know how it works for you and if you like it. Remember to please subscribe and hit the bell icon so you don't miss out. Okay. And uh, final thoughts. <clears throat> you should approach your outlines in a way that works best for you and not where you have to work best to use those outlines. An outline is a tool to help you get your story out and when it's not working for you that means you can try something new or you can even take the outline technique and mold it to what works for you this is what i did when i first found the 27 chapter outline i originally saw it as a plot point per chapter then i worked on it to realize its potential through my needs as a writer and found that i could work within plot points your job as a writer is to find ways to get your story onto the page Work that page once you finish, and then get to it and edit to clean it up as uh, you see fit. So there it is. Next video in this series will be a breakdown. Uh, I will break down the purpose of the first act. I'll go into it a little depth. It won't just be an overview. We'll just kind of really <clears throat> pick it apart. And then, uh, you know, other than that, that's it. It was good. It was an hour. Woo! Uh, remember I also have videos where I outline in real time. Those are live videos. I do them. 
I have some up already. I will probably get back to doing some of that stuff. And I got a lot of interesting things coming. So as always, keep developing the right mindset. I'll see you next time. Bye. Love you.